So we are back here at the Yorktown Battlefield here in Virginia and we're visiting one of the most well-known sites here at this battlefield and this is the location of readouts 9 and 10. Now this area of the battlefield gets a lot of publicity and rightfully so. Some key assaults happened here and those assaults were led by some key figures that you may or may not heard of. Um, so we're going to explore readouts 9 and 10 a little more and we're also going to explore a few other readouts that you may or may not know exist here today that Cornwallis had constructed. So on the night of October 14th, 400 Americans and 400 French would leave their trenches way back there, just beyond these trees. And that was the first American siege line. And their goal was to take readout number nine, just over here, and readout number 10, just above this berm here. Now something to remember is this berm wouldn't have been here. And right here is the York River. This would have extended out a little more. Time and erosion has... Uh, wreaked havoc here on this section of the battlefield. But just trying to give you a little layout of the land here. And this very field that we're standing on, this is where 400 Americans, led by Alexander Hamilton and Vimcomte de Vemenil, leading 400 French, would assault redoubts 9 and 10. So the redoubts on the American and French right, or the British left, were strong points, heavily fortified, and they were manned by some battle-hardened troops. Elements of the British Army and Hessian mercenaries manned both of these redoubts. So I'm on the field that the American and French soldiers would have been advancing on. And could you imagine, under the cover of night, you're advancing across an open field. Our original lines are way back that way. And they would advance with muskets unloaded. I'm going to say that again. They were advancing with their muskets unloaded and bayonets fixed. They didn't want to risk someone tripping and firing a stray shot. So the initial plan was to advance across this field and we're going to kneel and wait. And we're waiting for the engineers or pioneers as they called them at that time. Now these pioneers will be equipped with axes, shovels, picks, things of that nature. And their job was to hack their way through colonial era barbed wire were called abatee and abatee was a combination of logs sticks and other things like that and it made a very formidable defense so the pioneers were set to hack their way through the abatee and once the abatee was uh, compromised the American and French forces would advance now something I also want to point out you can see this berm here this is the second siege line okay this was constructed by the American and French engineers and army once these readouts were taken. So this was all clear. And now we're going to make our way to readout number 10. So I'm kneeling down in the very field that Alexander Hamilton would advance leading the 400 Americans on the assault on readout number 10. And instead of pausing here, waiting for those engineers, the Americans would just charge into readout 10. So the American forces, once they got close enough to readout 10, would charge up these ramparts here through the abatee and through these phrasings here and over the parapet and into the middle of the redoubt. And after some intense, brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat, the Americans would take this redoubt rather quickly. This is the recreation of redoubt number 10. Um, they found the original corner right here and they constructed this recreation to give us a good visual. But as you can see, where redoubt 10 lies is where the York River is currently eating sections of this battlefield due to erosion. So the majority of the American forces would make their way up this rampart here. Now a flanking force would come around this side. I believe 80 to 100 soldiers would come around this side and they would make their way up the parapet here. And like I said, after some hand-to-hand -hand combat, this redoubt was taken rather quickly. After the fighting was over, nine Americans lie dead, and I think another 12 to 20 lie wounded. So this is redoubt number 10 here. Now here's an account from Captain Stephen Olney of the Rhode Island Regiment. The column marched in silence, with guns unloaded and in good order. Many, no doubt, thinking that less than one quarter of a mile would finish the journey of life. 
And here is the 1st Rhode Island Infantry Regiment, and they were predominantly African American soldiers. So here it is, the assault on readout number 10. So now, let's go just up the line here, and we're gonna see readout number nine. So behind me is readout number nine. And on this very field before us here, this is where the French would be assaulting readout number nine. So these attacks were to be conducted simultaneously. But as the French soldiers were approaching readout number nine, someone from readout nine would call out to the advancing force. When there was no response, the Hessian and British soldiers within Readout 9 would let loose with a volley, cutting through the French ranks. Now, after this, the French would charge right into the teeth of Readout 9 here. And something to note is Readout 9 was a little more heavily fortified than Readout number 10. But you can just get a little visual as to what some of these soldiers here would have encountered. You have a pretty deep ditch there. And then up the parapet through the phrasing in Abatee, you would have your defenders inside. But much like readout number 10, once the attackers made it inside and after some fierce hand-to-hand -hand combat, the French would overtake this readout and the British would pull back to their inner lines just on the other side of this readout here. So before us is readout 9. Now once readout 9 and 10 were taken, this allowed the American and French forces to construct this. This is the second siege line. And now that these readouts were taken and in Allied hands, they can run this siege line all the way to the York River and truly encircle Cornwallis's position. So we revisited readouts 9 and 10. Now we're going to the other side of this siege line here and we're going to visit a readout that uh, you may or may not know existed. Uh, Cornwallis had several readouts in and around this area, not just 9 and 10, and uh, I'm looking forward to showing you some of these. We're here right out front of the American Revolution Museum here at Yorktown. And if you take a gander across the street, you'll come up to where the Royal Welsh Fusiliers readout was on the British right or the American and French left. Now, Cornwallis built several more readouts besides readouts 9 and 10, and this is one of them. And this is one that actually saw some pretty heavy fighting. And on the same night where American and French forces would attack readouts 9 and 10, the French would attack this readout right before that attack in what was called a diversionary attack or if you're a military tactician called a feint and the goal of this feint was to get the enemy looking one way and strike them where they're not looking and uh, the French would successfully complete that task they'd hit this uh, readout pretty hard and draw the British attention in this direction and shortly after that the Americans and French would hit the readouts 9 and 10 on the American and French right or the British left now, the Royal Welsh Fusiliers were a pretty stout British unit. I mean, the British Army was full of experienced, battle-hardened troops. But the Royal Welsh Fusiliers would be stationed here, and they'd withstand several French attacks. And this readout here would not fall until the surrender of the British force as a whole. Now, obviously, this is not the original earthworks before us, but this is the exact location of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers readout here. And here's an account of one of the French attacks on the redoubt. The enemy presumed that he would get possession of the redoubt on the right cheaply. The French attacked the redoubt right before our eyes. They were so warmly received by the English who did not fire until the French were in the Abbatee. And the Abbatee would be kind of like the colonial version of barbed wire. And that would be on the outside of your redoubt. So the British within the redoubt held their fire essentially until the French were right on top of the redoubt and uh, volleys from the British inside the redoubt would cause horrendous casualties among the French. This is the colors of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers. Though British forces were required to relinquish their regimental flags at the surrender ceremony, the flag of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers was smuggled back to Great Britain by two paroled officers of the regiment. That's pretty interesting. And let's make our way to the redoubt and have a closer look. Now obviously it's a reconstruction, but just the sheer size of these readouts 
would make these a very intimidating position to uh, attempt to attack. And we're making our way inside the fuselage readout here. Very cool. And there's a sign up ahead. Let's see what that says. And the sign reads, to the memory of the men of the Royal Welsh Fusiliers who unbroken held this redoubt against great odds in the siege of 1781. This tablet and flagstaff are erected with permission by their commanders of the regiment in 1957. And here is their field of fire. Obviously the museum wouldn't be there. This modern day highway wouldn't be there. But you can see how this position here secured uh, the British right. So before we continue on to the next British readout that I want to cover with you, I wanted to stop at this portion of the battlefield, which is just east of the Royal Wells Fusiliers Redoubt. And this French trench here before us is the extreme left of the American and French lines or the British right. And this earthwork was manned by the Regiment Taurine and formed the western portion of the French and American siege lines surrounding Yorktown. From this line, France fired upon ships in the York River and the British fort behind you. Now something else to note, from the extreme left of the American and French lines in this location, on October 9th it became the first battery of siege guns to fire on the British, aiming at the nearby Royal Welsh Fusiliers Redoubt. The French also effectively used this portion to help contain the British within the defensive lines and to harass the British ships anchored in the harbor. This is interesting too. On October 10th, using superheated cannonballs called Hot Shot, this French battery set fire to three British ships in the harbor. Wow. And if you need uh, any guide to where we are, we just visited the Fusiliers Redoubt there, and we are just to the left of that. Now another reason why I wanted to stop here is this. This is a memorial dedicated to the sailors and soldiers of the French Expeditionary Force who died for the independence of the United States during the Yorktown campaign. And here are the names of those soldiers from Rochambeau's army, General D. St. Simon, who was in command of this portion of the line, and the regiment below here, Regiment de Saintonge, Regiment de Saintonge. Apologize if I'm butchering the names. Now, if you watched the last episode, we visited a small French cemetery where 50 unidentified French soldiers were laid to rest. Now, something to remember is of the approximately 400 American and French soldiers that were killed and wounded here, two-thirds were French. So if you ever visit this area, be sure to at least visit the uh, small French cemetery or this monument here near the Royal Welsh Fusiliers Redoubt and pay your respects because these names, they died for our independence and that's something worth remembering. So there's a lot of notoriety surrounding Redoubts 9 and 10, but those weren't the only Redoubts that were constructed by Cornwallis. There is one Redoubt here that has remained untouched. So what we're about to see is the actual position and earthworks from 1781 that were constructed by the British. Now, no battle happened here. This redoubt was abandoned once uh, the American and French forces came in. Um, but we're about to see actual earthworks from 1781. So here we have the outer wall or rampart of this untouched redoubt. Again, this isn't reconstructed. This is the actual earthworks. And we're gonna follow this path up. Wow, this is awesome. Oh, there is one British redcoat lagging behind. Who goes there? So, we are inside this untouched readout. And man, this is awesome. We're literally standing on something that was constructed in 1781. Wow. Now, obviously a lot of this foliage here would have been cleared out or else it would have been a pretty difficult position to defend. But just want to kind of give you, I don't know if the camera's picking it up, but here is your rampart. And right here is your outer ditch. And you can kind of see the terrain pops back up. Wow. And here's the rest of it here. You can kind of see there's uh, my wife walking through the uh, woods here, doing her best swamp fox impression. Yeah, so this is the untouched readout of the Yorktown battlefield. Wow, this is so cool. <laughs> 